All right, engineers, in this video, we're gonna specifically talk about the regulation of gluconeogenesis. So we've already talked about gluconeogenesis and the pathway that's involved in it. In this part, remember I told you guys that we were gonna talk about what's called the glucose alanine cycle and the Cori cycle and how that's linking the muscles to the liver or vice versa? We're gonna do that first and then after that, I wanna talk about those enzymes, that Pepsi-K, that pyruvate carboxylase, and the fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, and what's regulating those enzymes. Okay, but first off, let's go into these two cycles. So the first cycle that we're gonna do first is the Cori cycle. Now, if you guys remember, I told you that in the muscle, we had glycogen, right? And whenever we had that glycogen, we could utilize that specific enzyme, which was called glycogen phosphorylase within the muscles, right? To convert that into glucose 6-phosphate. And again, what enzyme was doing this inside the muscle? This was the muscle, let's put M, glycogen phosphorylase. So the muscle glycogen phosphorylase was stimulating this step to break down the glycogen into glucose, uh, specifically to win glucose 1-phosphate. If we were to be really, really particular, it actually broke it down into glucose 1-phosphate. And then there was another enzyme that converted that glucose 1-phosphate into glucose 6-phosphate. If we were being very, very specific, this was the phosphoglucomutase. So we'll put phosphoglucomutase enzyme. Now, this glucose 6-phosphate, we said it can't get out of the cell. And the skeletal muscles or different types of muscle tissues do not have that enzyme called glucose 6-phosphatase that can rip off that phosphate. Remember it was in the endoplasmic reticulum? This, there's no enzyme like that in the muscles. So we're going to have to do something else to disguise that glucose in a different form. So we can do two things. Okay, so let's say I take off, I take off this pathway right here. So I come over here and I branch into a different path, because this is where we're gonna branch into the Cori cycle, and then we'll come over back and talk about the glucose alanine cycle. So you know glucose 6-phosphate can undergo glyco glycolysis, and at the end of glycolysis, you produce what's called pyruvate, right? And then throughout that process of glycolysis, I can actually generate a total of two ATP. So within the skeletal muscle, I can actually generate two ATP if we take into consideration anaerobic processes. But then, in this glycolysis pathway, we end up with pyruvate, right? Pyruvate can't actually be put into the blood in this form. We have to do it in a different form. So what we're going to do is, is if you guys remember, there was a special uh, molecule. You guys probably remember that enzyme. It was called lactate dehydrogenase. It was the guy that the soldiers, soldiers were treating on, right? The bald guy. What was he doing? The lactate dehydrogenase was acting on pyruvate. And what it was doing is, it was unloading NADHs onto the pyruvate. So it was unloading NADHs onto the pyruvate to convert into NAD positive. And what was the molecule that was formed as a result of this? This was lactic acid. What happens to this lactic acid? I'm gonna take this lactic acid and I'm gonna push it out of the muscle cell and into the blood, okay? So now I'm gonna take this lactic acid and I'm gonna put this into the blood, all right? Then what I'm gonna do with this lactic acid is I'm gonna take it up in the liver. So the liver is now going to take up this lactic acid. So this lactic acid is gonna go through the blood and it's gonna get taken up by the liver. When it gets taken up by the liver, there's another pathway here. So now, look what happens in here. I'm gonna bring this lactic acid in, into the liver. When I bring it into the liver, so here's my lactic, acid. I can reconvert that back into what? I can reconvert this back into pyruvate. How? Because you know that, and let's actually keep this consistent, what color was this over there? It was actually a pink arrow, right? So now let's have a pink arrow here coming up. So lactic acid to pyruvate. Now if you remember, there was a specific enzyme catalyzing this step. This enzyme was called lactate dehydrogenase. This is also present within the liver, present in many tissues. What it's doing is it's stimulating this enzyme, but now the pathway is opposite. So now in this pathway, I'm going to take NAD positives and generate NADHs, and then look what I'm going to do with this pyruvate. I can now take this pyruvate, and guess what I can do to him in the liver? I can take this pyruvate and go backwards up to glucose 6-phosphate. 
What can I do with that glucose 6-phosphate? I can take this glucose 6-phosphate, now I have in the liver, what is that structure in the liver that's really, really special? If you guys remember. The endoplasmic reticulum. And in the endoplasmic reticulum, there was a special enzyme. What was that enzyme that was inside of the endoplasmic reticulum? That enzyme inside here was called glucose 6 phosphatase. And what happens? We could take that glucose 6 phosphate off of this glucose. So we're going to bring this in through a specific type of transporter like T1, bring it in, have it acted on by this enzyme. And when it's acted on by that enzyme, now you get free glucose. And then what did it release off of it? It released off a phosphate. What was the name of this enzyme? This enzyme is specifically called glucose 6 phosphatase. That enzyme right there is called glucose 6 phosphatase. And this enzyme is only present in the liver or the kidney or also even certain types of tissues within the GI tract, particularly the duodenum. But now we have this free glucose. Now we can take that free glucose and transport it out of this endoplasmic reticulum through T2 transporters and bring that glucose out. Where can that glucose go? It can be contributed into the blood. So now we can take this glucose that we have here and put that glucose specifically into the bloodstream. So here's our free glucose. So now look what happened. You see how I told you that the muscle specifically could break down glycogen but could only break it up to this point and then it stops because it doesn't have the enzyme? We got the actual what? We got it in the form of, we took this glucose in the form of lactic acid. We just hit the glucose 6-phosphate in the form of lactic acid. And then what do we do? We took that lactic acid to the liver and then reconverted it into glucose, free glucose that could get put into the blood. But you know what? A cycle doesn't just end right there. It has to go back. So what can happen then? I can take this glucose, and to end the cycle, I bring the glucose where? I bring the glucose back in to this cell. And I'll convert it into glucose 6-phosphate, right? Because you know that there's an enzyme that does this step too. What is the enzyme that catalyzes this conversion? This is called in the liver hexokinase. So what is this cycle here called that we just did? This whole cycle that we just did is specifically called the, let's write it over here. This is specifically the Cori cycle. And it's just basically how we're getting the actual glucose from the muscle to the liver to be converted actually into free glucose. Because really, the muscle can only get to glucose 6-phosphate and then it stops. Because it doesn't have that enzyme. Now, there's another thing that we can do. And again, what is this process here called? Whenever we're taking this lactic acid, remember when we did gluconeogenesis, when we take this lactic acid into the liver and we convert that lactic acid into glucose, what is this process here called? Gluconeogenesis. So this is the process of gluconeogenesis where we're taking the lactic acid and then converting it into glucose in the liver. But you know what else the muscle can do? It can take and divert. So now let's actually do this in blue. And look what else it can do it can convert this glucose 6-phosphate into pyruvate again, right? So let's say here's our pyruvate. But then it can take this pyruvate and it can combine it with a specific type of amino acid. You know what that amino acid is called? That amino acid is called glutamate. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this pyruvate and I'm going to react it with an amino acid called glutamate. And what I'm going to do is the glutamate is an amino acid, right? So it has an amine group on it it's going to transfer his amine group onto pyruvate. And then glutamate will actually get converted into alpha-ketoglutarate. So now, what is the result of these two reacting? The result is I'm gonna get two molecules. One molecule I'm gonna draw coming off of this reaction that we're not gonna be really caring too much about. That is called alpha-ketoglutarate. That is coming from glutamate. The other product is when the amine group gets transferred onto the pyruvate. And it gets transferred onto the pyruvate and could, gets converted into alanine. You know alanine is an amino acid. So what did I just do? I took glucose 6-phosphate, turned it into pyruvate, and oh, what do you generate out of this process right here? What do you generate from this? Two ATP by anaerobic mechanisms, right? Assuming anaerobic mechanisms. I hid the glucose 6-phosphate in the form of pyruvate, but then that wasn't good enough. 
Then I have to take the glutamate. I have to give the glutamate that has uh, you know, the amine group on the glutamate, I give it to the pyruvate. When I give the amine group from glutamate to pyruvate, glutamate turns into alpha-ketoglutarate, which is a keto acid in the Krebs cycle. And then pyruvate gains the amine group and it gets converted into alanine. Where can this alanine go? So now this alanine can get transported in the blood. So now look at this. This alanine is gonna come where? This alanine is gonna come through the blood, right? It's gonna come through the blood. And then where can it go? It can go into the liver. What is it gonna do in the liver? All right, so look at this. We bring this guy in to the liver. So here's our alanine. Here's our alanine right there. Alanine. Oh, butchered that spelling. Let's put alanine. Alanine. Specifically, alanine. Now that I have this alanine, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to try to get rid of that amine group. So I'm going to get rid of that amine group. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the alanine, and you know that there's enzymes inside of the liver that I can actually have here. You know I can take this alanine and I can combine it with another type of molecule. I can combine this with, maybe let's say I combine it with alpha, keto, glutarate. Let's say I combine it with alpha ketoglutarate. So I take alanine, I combine it with alpha ketoglutarate. Alanine is an amino acid. He transfers his amine group onto alpha ketoglutarate. As a result, let's draw this in pink here. Look at this. As a result of this reaction, these two reacting, look what I get. Coming off of this reaction is going to be the insignificant part. You know alpha ketoglutarate, he gains the amine group from the alanine. When he gains the amine group from the alanine, he gets reconverted back into glutamate. And then we'll talk in another video that this glutamate undergoes what's called oxidative deamination. So in other words, he'll get rid of his amine group in the form of ammonia, and he'll get regenerated into alpha, keto, glutarate, and then this will go into the urea cycle. And we'll talk about this in amino acid metabolism. But for right now, we don't care about that. We care about what happened to this alanine. Alanine transfers his amine group onto alpha ketoglutarate. Alpha ketoglutarate transfers his oxygen onto alanine. And alanine now becomes something different. He becomes pyruvate. What can happen with that pyruvate? That pyruvate can get converted into what? Glucose 6-phosphate. And then from that glucose 6-phosphate, what can happen? He can get converted back into free glucose. And then that glucose, then what can happen with that glucose? He can then be taken back to the muscle. So then let's actually show this step here, that this pyruvate can then get converted into glucose 6-phosphate. Then from that glucose 6-phosphate, what can happen? I can take that glucose 6-phosphate, have it be acted on by glucose 6-phosphatase. And then that glucose 6-phosphatase, what can happen to him? That glucose 6-phosphatase can convert the glucose 6-phosphate into free glucose, and then put that glucose into the bloodstream. What is this process here called when I take this alanine and I basically help to convert it into free glucose, glucose then goes to the liver, comes back out as alanine? It's called the glucose alanine cycle. It's simple. All right, so again, what is this process here called? Glucose alanine cycle. Now, we talked about the Cori cycle, we talked about the glucose alanine cycle. Now I need to talk about one more thing to finish off. You remember those enzymes, those specific enzymes that we, uh, we talked about a lot in gluconeogenesis? Specifically the three ones. Specifically PEPCK, which stood for phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase. And then we had another enzyme. This one was called pyruvate carboxylase. And then there is one, it's not as significant, but we should mention it regardless. It's going to be fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. So again, this is called fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. The question at hand is, what is regulating these enzymes? Because we talked about how these enzymes are working. We told you what they, we know what they do. We know that pyruvate carboxylase does what? It converts specifically pyruvate into oxaloacetate. We know that. We know that specifically this pyruvate carboxylase is taking what? It's taking the pyruvate and converting it out into oxaloacetate. But the next question is, what's regulating this enzyme? What's stimulating this enzyme? You know this enzyme is specifically stimulated by acetyl-CoA. So acetyl-CoA can actually allosterically, 
stimulate this enzyme. Because you know whenever there's too much acetyl-CoA, that means that there's a lot of Krebs cycle activity, and that means that we don't need to keep breaking down the glucose. We can actually take and get those, we can make, make glucose now. So now, whenever there's excessive amounts of acetyl-CoA, it'll stimulate the pyruvate carboxylase, which will convert pyruvate into oxaloacetate. And then you could also have certain things that could actually inhibit this enzyme. What would inhibit this enzyme? Well, there would be the opposite of acetyl-CoA. Maybe CoA could stimulate this enzyme. Or you could even say low energy signals. So maybe certain type of situations in which there is high amounts of ADP. So maybe high amounts of ADP, which is signaling that there's low energy signals, this could stimulate, I'm sorry, inhibit this enzyme. Because if you want, you're, you're going to want to inhibit this enzyme. If there's low energy signals, you're going to want to divert this from making glucose and start breaking down glucose to make ATP. So this should inhibit this enzyme. Okay. What about Pepsi-K? Pepsi-K is a whole different animal. He's actually regulated based upon synthesis. You know, there's a very, very important hormone in our body that's released during very, very uh, long-term stress or in situations when our blood glucose levels are low or maybe even when we have a fever. It's specifically called cortisol. Cortisol is a steroid hormone. And what cortisol can do is, you know he's actually a steroid hormone so he can activate specific genes. And he'll activate specific genes that'll synthesize all of these enzymes. So look at this. Upon the presence of cortisol, and when is cortisol released? Cortisol is released whenever your blood glucose levels are really low, hypoglycemia, and also during stress, but more of like the chronic stress. Okay, and what is he gonna wanna do? He's going to want to be able to promote gluconeogenesis. So what does he do? He synthesizes more Pepsi-K, more pyruvate carboxylase, and more fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase so that we can actually have these enzymes break down all these molecules to make glucose. Because these enzymes are what are facilitating the making of glucose. Now, we know that specifically cortisol is regulating Pepsi-K by stimulating him. You know there's other in, um, hormones that are also doing this too, not just cortisol, but even glucagon. Glucagon is another hormone that is also going to be helping in this process, but specifically the stimulation of Pepsi-K or even the stimulation of pyruvate carboxylase via phosphorylation reactions. And we can even say technically phosphorylation of this fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, right? But specifically, how is glucagon regulating it? Glucagon is helping within the synthesis of Pepsi-K, he's helping in the synthesis of pyruvate carboxylase, and he's helping in the synthesis of fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. But if you had to remember the more important one, the significant one, you need to remember cortisol. Cortisol is the primary one that's leading to the synthesis of Pepsi-K, pyruvate carboxylase, and fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. If we have more of these, then we can have more of these enzymes available for gluconeogenesis. One more thing, this enzyme, he's also heavily regulated. You know how he's actually regulated? So let's actually get rid of this glucagon one here because glucagon does it in a weird way. He regulates this enzyme in a very, very weird way. Okay, you remember this molecule called fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. This molecule is a very strong inhibitor of this enzyme. Now, we have to go back for just a second, not too long, and explain how this fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is made. You guys remember we had that binuclear uh, dimer, that component of this actual molecule here. We had this guy right here and this guy right here. And it was actually broken into two components, but it was one enzyme. One component of the enzyme was phosphofructokinase 2, and the other one was fructose 2,6-bisphosphatase. And this was one whole enzyme. If you remember, the phosphofructokinase 2 was taking fructose, what? 6-phosphate and converting it into fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Then, this enzyme here, fructose 2,6-bisphosphatase, was actually being ripped away. So then look here, I'm going to do it with a different arrow. Fructose 2,6-bisphosphatase can rip off the phosphate off of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate and convert it back into fructose 6-phosphate. Now, if you guys remember that there was actually hormones that were activating these guys. So what was actually activating? Well, first off, before I do that, what was this fructose 2,6-phosphate really good for? Besides saying absolutely nothing. You know, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, what was he doing? Remember that specific molecule, phosphofructokinase 1? Remember that fructose 2,6-bisphosphate 
is the strongest stimulator of phosphofructokinase 1. If you have a lot of this enzyme, I'm sorry, if you have a lot of this fructose 3,6-bisphosphate, it'll stimulate PFK1, which will trigger glycolysis. But if you want to do the opposite, you're going to want to rip off the fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. So now the question is, how would glucagon or epinephrine or noroepinephrine regulate this enzyme? Okay, so let's think about this logically. This molecule wants to stimulate PFK1. So I need to get rid of him. So these molecules, glucagon, epinephrine, and uh, norepinephrine, are gonna activate protein kinase A. Protein kinase A is going to phosphorylate. What is he gonna phosphorylate? He's gonna phosphorylate this whole enzyme. When he phosphorylates this whole enzyme, two things happen. When this component of the enzyme is phosphorylated, this one, the PFK2, right? When this enzyme is phosphorylated, what happens? He is actually going to be what? Inhibited. If he is inhibited, this part if it's inhibited. If this is phosphorylated, this whole enzyme, this part is inhibited. And this part is stimulated. Why, what will that do? Okay, if this part is stimulated, it'll convert fructose 2,6-bisphosphate into fructose 6-phosphate. What does that mean for the fructose 2,6-bisphosphate concentration? His concentration is gonna do what? It's gonna go down. If his concentration goes down, is he gonna be able to stimulate PFK1? No, so he will no longer be able to stimulate PFK1. Another thing is, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is inhibiting this enzyme. If there is decreased concentration of this fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, then what will happen? There won't be as much of this guy. And what will happen? This will stimulate this enzyme. Okay? So again, let's do this one more time. There's a binuclear enzyme consisting of phosphofructokinase 2 and fructose 2,6-bisphosphatase. If you have glucagon, epinephrine, and norepinephrine, they'll activate protein kinase A, who will phosphorylate this whole dimer, but whole nuclear uh, protein. When it does that, it phosphorylates the whole thing. When it phosphorylates it, it inhibits the PFK2 portion. So he can't convert fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. That part's inhibited. But whenever it's phosphorylated, it activates the fructose 2,6-bisphosphatase, which cleaves the phosphate off of what? The second carbon and converts it into fructose 6-phosphate. When fructose 2,6-bisphosphate's concentration decreases, he can no longer stimulate PFK1. So glycolysis is inhibited. Also, when his concentration decreases, he no longer is able to inhibit this fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, and now this fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase is released from inhibition. And then he can do what? He can cleave fructose 1,6-bisphosphate into fructose 6-phosphate, which will then help to go and make glucose. Okay, engineers, we covered basically the regulation of gluconeogenesis. We covered the Cori cycle and the glucose alanine cycle in this video. I hope it all made sense. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, hit that like button, subscribe, and comment down in the comment section. All right, engineers, until next time.